Yeah. So many thanks uh, to all of you for uh, joining us today uh, for this uh, symposium on uh, uh, Arthashastra. What we are exploring today uh, is the trends in uh, publish, publishing and in writings in the last few years by uh, some of our own people and also a few people from outside who have been uh, researching uh, the Arthashastra and Kautilya from various angles, especially from historical as well as from uh, strategic angles. It's a great pleasure that uh, some uh, original work is now uh, being done uh, in India. And uh, we are beginning to uh, develop an Indian understanding of uh, Cortilia and his uh, uh, teachings. Of course, to this uh, uh, audience, I don't have to uh, describe the importance of uh, studying uh, Arthashastra and Cortilia. Uh, there are many reasons why one would uh, like to study him, uh, but uh, we are uh, in a uh, think tank where uh, we look at the historical as well as strategic uh, aspects of our. Uh, 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 nation. And uh, I think Arthashastra is uh, one great text uh, which has uh, attracted the attention of the world. And uh, many people and some excellent uh, work has been done uh, in the recent uh, decades uh, abroad. But uh, it is also equally uh, important that uh, we should uh, in India uh, study this from Indian angle. And that is what is beginning to happen. And uh, I uh, congratulate uh, those who have uh, taken uh, this subject for study in the last few years. And uh, today, uh, uh, some of uh, you are here to discuss uh, with us uh, uh, your work and also uh, outline uh, the key findings uh, of your work. And also suggest uh, uh, what is the way ahead and what is the direction of research. Uh, in the think tank community, uh, Arthashastra and Kautilya, I think to some extent uh, has been uh, caricatured also. Uh, we know a little bit about uh, him, but not uh, enough. So we can talk about uh, his uh, Mandala theory, which is the most prominent feature of uh, uh, his work that is studied in our uh, think tanks. And we also talk about Chanakya Niti, which is essentially confused with the uh, uh, Machiavellism and uh, also some lack of morality. Uh, I think Arthashastra or and Kautilya, Kautilya have been studied uh, mostly in simplistic terms and often been caricatured. And also the West has also played a role in uh, that caricaturing, uh, projecting him as uh, uh, Machiavelli of uh, India and essentially in a pejorative uh, sense. But I think uh, the Arthashastra work, uh, which was also followed by many other uh, important works over the centuries, and it seems to us that there have been Arthashastras even before uh, Kautilya's Arthashastra. All this should be studied uh, as a uh, composite of uh, uh, statecraft uh, in the widest possible sense in which uh, the Indian thinking had evolved. And this itself, the statecraft was rooted in the notion of uh, dharma and the dharma shastras. And uh, the Arthashastra has essentially uh, curled out the dharmic principles of uh, uh, our thought and uh, trying to give it a practical touch, which is uh, how a king should uh, behave. So, uh, but this all, I think the nuances have been lost. And we have uh, taken a very simplistic uh, view. And that is, I think, what we need to uh, change. And in order to do that, uh, it is uh, essential that uh, we understand uh, the Indian thought and culture in its uh, uh, entirety and in its uh, sheer scope and uh, breadth, rather than just uh, call out uh, one chapter or one quotation from Shastra and uh, try and uh, you know project something which may be uh, not entirely correct. And uh, yesterday you saw, uh, um, uh, you would have seen uh, PM's speech at uh, the uh, Bhumi Pujan ceremony. And uh, his speech is uh, uh, 
also one indication of uh, the richness of Indian uh, thinking, the value system which uh, Mariada Pushottam Ram uh, indicated. And if you look at those uh, values, which is of compassion, which is of social harmony, uh, truth, honesty, and also uh, many others uh, like that which were mentioned, which is the really basis of the uh, Indian uh, dharma and Indian civilization. And Arthashatra also comes from that uh, tradition. So I think we should uh, link up uh, this with the larger uh, notion of uh, the dharma. And uh, some of you may have attended our earlier seminar on dharma uh, also. So I think uh, in uh, totality, in uh, this collective work is uh, uh, very important. And this seminar is, uh, symposium is being organized to uh, uh, take this uh, uh, study forward. So thank you very much for uh, being with us. And uh, we have, uh, uh, I want to welcome uh, particularly the uh, speakers and the departments. Uh, Rupin Bhattacharaji, who is a Vivekanan chair in the uh, University of uh, Calcutta. Sir Chattopadhyay. Chattopadhyay, I'm sorry. And uh, what did I say? You said Acharya. I'm sorry. Uh, then uh, our own Arpita, who has uh, been really anchoring this uh, various uh, seminars. And then uh, Professor Kajri Kamal, who is in the Takshila Institution. And uh, Dr. Saurabh Mishra, who is now a professor at the uh, MIT. Dr. Medha Bisht, uh, who is uh, teaching at the South Asian University. Uh, then Colonel uh, uh, Gautam, who has uh, spearheaded uh, the project on uh, ancient thinking, etc. And uh, and uh, he has uh, written a lot in the last few years. And in some sense, he's also inspired many of uh, these uh, uh, researches in the last few years. Now he's with the USI. Uh, we are also very uh, honored that uh, the Guru Murthy Ji, uh, if he has not already joined, he would be joining us uh, shortly. Uh, and uh, he would also give up at the end of, at the, at the, end of uh, the uh, sessions, two sessions that we have. He will also share his uh, observations uh, with us after listening to the uh, speakers. And uh, he will also uh, provide guidance and his thoughts on uh, how uh, re research should, uh, in which, what direction should uh, research uh, be done and what direction should it be taken. So uh, it's a, a process which is ongoing and uh, uh, we hope uh, that uh, more such works uh, from Indian uh, scholars will come in the future and enrich our understanding of this very important uh, Indian and his uh, work. So thank you very much. And uh, now we uh, begin the uh, first session, uh, which is uh, the historical uh, trend in the study of uh, Arthashastra. And I invite uh, Professor uh, Rupin Bhattacharya for uh, his remarks. So all the speakers have 10 minutes uh, to make their uh, points. And uh, later on, we'll have uh, some discussion. So Professor Rupin Bhattacharya. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can be heard. Okay. Yeah. Yes, please. I think there's some problem over this. I think Rupin Babu is perhaps uh, having some connectivity issue. Uh, he cannot hear us? No, I don't think. Uh, I think he's, he got disconnected. Oh. Just so, find out. We'll just find out. But I think Arpita can, in the meanwhile, start. Uh, Arpita, her... then you can start and then he can join us later. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you want me to start then? Yes, start and keep it to 10 minutes. 
Ha, am I properly audible? Yes, yes, please go ahead. In a way, my presentation should have followed Professor Chattopadhyay's presentation, but let me start. Never mind. Uh, so I'm discussing this new book on the Arthashastra by Mark McLeish. Mark McLeish uh, has been a student of Patrick Olivelle, who is uh, I, Rupen Babu has joined Anuttamadi. So okay, okay, okay. In that case, we can switch back to Professor huh. Bhattacharya. Yeah. Yes, uh, we can see you. Please go ahead, Professor uh, Chattopadhyay. Hello. Should I should I start? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Please. Uh, at, at the very outset, I must admit that I am extremely grateful to you all, uh, including uh, Dr. Arvind Gupta ji, uh, Madam, Urpita Madam, and others. For having me the you know, provided with of opportunity, with an opportunity to talk to, um, and discuss about the Shastra as a text and its allied problem, and the recent contribution by um, Patrick Olivelle. Uh, then, um, with my all limitation, I, I have tried uh, to um, uh, convey some of my a uh, uh, point to share you uh, with a view how one could uh, read and revisit Orto Shastra uh, in the following manner. Next slide, please. Uh, yes. So that if you go through the uh, uh, recent contribution or the historiography, then or the contribution on the text, the scholar, uh, how mm, mm, uh, mm, uh, read the text and giving new commentary on the text. And the second one is the sources and it utilizes its utilization to interpret the different di dimension of historical thoughts as well as the social dynamic, political, religious, cultural, economic, administrative, and so on. And the last one, the debates on the date of Arthashastra. So that is the valid point nowadays, since uh, Patrick Olivelle contributed much on uh, the, the date and authorship of Arthashastra. Next. Uh, now, as you know, I should not spend more time on Shama Shastri's work and how the J.F. Phillips uh, is also uh, was also a, a great contributor uh, with a short introduction on Orthashastra, including uh, the internal and foreign uh, civil, military, commercial, fiscal, judicial, and other things that uh, uh, that. Uh, a diverse um, uh, aspect of Orthoshastra um, is contribute uh, has enough um, uh, merit to um, uh, uh, read the ancient world. Next, uh, Kangle um, is the next person. Uh, I hope uh, since he, um, he has an enormous contribution uh, reading the text. Uh, a translation, and then the third volume we go through. He has pointed out uh, the major features of uh, Orthoshastra and how Orthoshastra could, uh, could be utilized to interpret the ancient Indian uh, judicial system, uh, the code of conduct, modern policies, calamities, words. Court uh, annexations and various scientific methods so that uh, the administration, judiciary, bureaucracy, internal security, and administrative of external affairs. Next. Uh, next. 
and actually <laughs> Julius Jolly, uh, early 1913, uh, also contributed on the text and its relationship with the Dharma Shastra uh, in German language. Kani is also contributed in the same direction, uh, how the Dharma Shastra is closely related with Dharma Shastra. Didi Koshambi's work is important because he raised certain issues, uh, attempted textual analysis of Arthasatra in addition to identify uh, the uh, multiple lacuna in the textual interpretation. Next. And then the sources, how the Arthasatra utilized to interpret different aspects of ancient society, economy, uh, in, in in India, uh, cattle theft is by Johnston is a valuable work contributed much on the legal attributes of, of cattle theft uh, and other uh, prevailed in ancient India and then uh, uh, Shundar Lal Hora, uh, another contributor of, of contributor on the same line on fishery uh, so that um, how uh, the uh, fishery uh, is one of the major issue um, that prevailed in ancient india so that ancient fishery management uh, of toxic fish and other things so that is a very important one next actually um, mg dikshit on glass uh, how the glass referred to in Ortho Shastra uh, and its utility. Even Ghoshal, uh, the uh, 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 stalwart historian, uh, utilized Ortho Shastra in different uh, reconstruction, Hindu revenue system, Hindu public life in the Primorian Morian, besides the cultural dimension in the later work. Similarly, if you go through the Othindo Nath Bosch uh, in economic history of early India, you will get enough reference to Artha Shastra for for explaining agricultural goods and other things. Uh, and uh, Aradhana. Karma, who has also worked on techniques of statecraft and the study of Artha Shastra. Next. Shatadeep's work on state brokerage of Artha Shastra is also valuable at him. Subhita Jaiswal, while doing the gender analysis of ancient India, he also contributed the female images referred to in the court titles of Artha Shastra. Uh, and then the other works like gems, uh, karma, taxation, uh, and revenue collection, and other things, the relationship between the contemporary uh, text, Mahabharata, Manushangita, and Nitishar, or other things. So that uh, this text is also very important and contributed much the relationship between Otto Shastra and the contemporary literary other literary sources. Next. Now, uh, Patrick Olive, uh, his contribution uh, on King Griffin law in ancient India is certainly a breakthrough so far as the new dimension of uh, reading Otto re Shastra is concerned and the debate uh, on date of the Artha Shastra and uh, the authorship of the Artha Shastra, besides other things. He has also pointed out how, in a, in a recent paper, four feet of legal procedures and the origin of jurisprudence in ancient India, uh, published in Journal of American Oriental Society 2015. Uh, here he explored uh, the term Dharma, Dando, uh, Babohara, and Achar, the four feet of uh, the Indian uh, ethics of jurisprudence. And he has successfully uh, conceptualized 
the problem with the term and the scholar used earlier so on and here we will also try to give a look on the long distance trade in ancient india evidence from orthoshastras here i must say one of the major parameters of human trust is trade and commerce and one of the most effective opens of historian disposal to reconstruct that past is definitely the past repository of the literary text patrick oliver refers extremely well in both of it for he remarked we reconstruct the commercial history of ancient india through a careful study of the important text of orthoshastra another interesting aspect outlined in the article is the prevalence of globalization uh, in the in, in the ancient world uh, as olivelle calls it uh, one that we generally consider to be a modern world phenomena so that how globalization process could be read with the help of orthoshastra in ancient india the article essentially story of mobility of goods uh, along with it, that of people and and ideas uh, and utterly uh, the geographical pace is important so far as his uh, contribution is concerned how nepal china uh, to orisha bengal and assam tamil nadu sri lanka kerala uh, to afghanistan iran and other adjoining areas of mediterranean world and the item primarily and the item primarily traded including including uh, luxury items pearls gems same precious stones and precious stones including diamonds perfumes ivory bullion uh, and hoods and several commodity exchange program that could be followed in in ancient world or ancient india and its adjoining area and how orthoshastra is also contributed much on this on the same line another particular interesting point trade structure was strong mechanism implementing uh for securing commercial trade routes and realizing tax and levies taxes and levies on imported goods that's why uh, frontiers uh, commanders uh, like uh, on the pala were installed in the uh, kingdom's entrance to regulate trade import and safeguard commerce and or caravan within the kingdom were provided the military protection for safety of goods in turn uh, the uh, mercantile community how they reciprocated with the taxation uh, so that the tax called vartani uh, uh, is a essential component referred to orthoshastra and other things referred that um, the superintendents of shipping and port in a vadaksha na daksha patana daksha in etc refer in the work of orthoshastra certainly all everything depicting the trade and commerce during the time of the mauryan mauryan and post mauryan period about the date debate on date i must say there is a very important next slide obijit yes yes so that uh, uh, so that uh, one may uh, go to the numerous literary sources uh, at um, contemporary orthoshastra to uh, to um, re edit um, the debate or to encourage to the debate on the date of orthoshastra generally uh, 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 ascribe uh, between mauryan to post mauryan and um, olivelle um, while uh, um, uh, talking about uh, orthoshastra um, uh, uh, dating um, uh, problem uh, he is um, specifically interested to highlight 
the um, different um, uh, specific materials refer to Arthashastra, that is Shala, Prabhala, Shubhagna, uh, to justifying his supposition of Arthashastra as a post Mauryan, that is between mid um, uh, first century uh, BCE to mid uh, first century CE. Uh, I I'm, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk before you. And uh, and hurriedly I finished the thing. I, I'm extremely I'm extremely sorry for my hurried reading. Uh, for huh. your uh, uh, presentation, and now I request uh, Arpita to make her uh, presentation. So I'm going to present on this new book by Mark McLeish. Mark McLeish is a student of Patrick Oliven. You already had an idea about Oliver's contribution to the subject. He has been writing consistently on the Dharma Shastra tradition, Artha Shastra tradition, and other texts of ancient India. He's basically a Sanskritist. So his student Mark McLeish has also attempted a philological reconstruction of the history of the text of the Artha Shastra. His book is titled The History of the Artha Shastra: Sovereignty and Sacred Law in Ancient India. It came out in 2019. This book is about the compositional history of the Arthashastra. Using the text historical method, the author has tried to deconstruct and reconstruct the history of the text. He argues that the Kautilya Arthashastra, as it has come down to us, is neither a single text nor the work of a single author. I'll first summarize his main arguments, then I'll get into my uh, uh, questions and comments and critique. So McLeish's argument is that there existed an original text, which he chooses to call the Dandaniti. We know that Dandaniti in ancient India was the science of governance, but uh, this is also a name he is giving to this original text, according to him, which was the core or the kernel text of the Arthashastra. According to McLeish, this text comprised seven major themes and was complete in two halves, one on domestic affairs called Tantra, and another on foreign affairs called Avapa. And that's it. This is against the current text that we have of 150 chapters in 15 books. So you can imagine if this is true, if what McLeish is saying is right, then the amount of reduction that has happened. Now, McLeish cannot ascertain who the author of the Dandaniti was, this original text. He dates this original text to uh, around 1st century BC. Then he argues that sometime around 3rd century AD, the text underwent a major reduction, which involved adding of recasting the text of the Dharma Shastra and also renaming it as Artha Shastra of Kautilya. Now, sometime around 4th century AD, he argues. Uh, Legend and tradition identified the author of Arthashastra with Chanakya, who was the counselor of Chandragupta Maurya. This is the story he constructs. Now, so far, all major scholars, in effect, uh, Maklish departs from existing historiography on the Arthashastra in three ways. One is that he gives a new history of the text itself. Second is that he does not agree with previous scholars regarding its authorship. And third is that he's giving a new date to the text. Let me first discuss briefly the issue of authorship and date. So far, all major scholars on Arthashastra have accepted unitary authorship for the text. All of them argue that it is the work of a single author. We know that the, I mean, Kangli in fact mentions that at times there seems to be disjunctures, but they are not so great as to accept that somebody else, that it is the work of more than one author. So we know that Kautilya Arthashastra mentions two names as its author. One is Kautilya, the other is Vishnugupta. And tradition attributes a third name, which is Chanakya. So far, scholars had argued that it is the same person. Vishnugupta is the name given to him in the naming ceremony, as we all have our names. Chanakya is the family name, son of Chanakya, and Kautilya must be the Gotra name. Maklish is unable to comment on the identity of Vishnugupta in the text. 
he does not accept that Chanakya, the minister of Chandragupta Maurya, is the same person as Kautilya, the redactor of the text. Furthermore, Kautilya is the redactor of the text in his argument, but he cannot provide a name for the author of the text, which he calls Dandaniti, the original text. There is no mention anywhere in the text of any other author. Now, briefly about the date. We know that Kangle dated it to the modern period, that is 4th century BC. Uh, you just heard the previous speaker also referring to the debates on the date. Now, both Patrick Olivelle and McLeish date the Arthas to a later date. McLeish is arguing that there is a mention of a particular object called Alakandaka. It is a particular type of coral which originates in Alexandria and archaeological evidence says that the trade of this material was in operation during the end of the 2nd century BC. And according to him, Boston. <coughs> I think we have lost her. Arithuma, can you give a call and yeah, just yeah, check? Yeah, I'll, I'll just find out. Yeah. Yeah. This is happening very often in webinars now. Uh, Paul failure. Who could go over that? Hello, can you hear me? Go ahead. Yeah, so now, incidentally, there is no text whatsoever in the Sanskrit sources called Dandaniti. Had this Dandaniti, which McLeish is saying existed, really existed, then I'm sure, and had it been an important work, then I'm sure some Sanskrit source would have referred to it. But McLeish himself admits that no Sanskrit sources refers to a text called Dandaniti. I'm, not, I'm also not uh, very clear about how he arrives at such a name for the original text, that the text, we can call that text Dandaniti. So this part is very unclear that how he arrives that this must have been a different text by this name Dandaniti. Now in ancient India, we did have a very vibrant textual culture. Uh, there have been many important texts which have undergone reduction, extrapolation, and come down to us in recensions. Mahabharata is the classic example. We deal with the, when we talk about the Mahabharata, we basically deal with the Gupta post Gupta recension. But there is one point which I have in mind, which is that let's take the example of the Charaka Samhita. It is known within tradition that the Charaka Samhita involves the work of at least three authors. Charaka himself refers to the system of Agnivesh, the Tantra of Agnivesh. So there is a core text the, which you can call the Agnivesh Tantra. Charaka himself mentions that he edited and built upon that material and expanded it to create the text Charaka Samhita. Then you have a later redactor to the text that is Dhridhavala. He says that a part of Charaka Samhita was lost and he had to do a lot of sadhana to recover that. And what he has written is basically Charaka's, uh, what might have been the lost part of Charaka's text. So tradition knows that the Charaka Samhita is the work of three authors at least. So why is it that the uh, tradition around Arthashastra does not refer to any other author? This is also a question which we must ask. Now we know that the Arthashastra itself mentions previous teachers of the science of uh, statecraft, Manu, Ushanasa, Brihaspati, Parashara. The Mahabharata mentions seven such teachers. The Buddhist Pali literature also mentioned teachers. So is there any reason for the redactor or the author of the Arthashastra not to mention Anybody else's name? We don't know. Now there is the question of McLeish's methodology. He has applied the text historical or text critical or historical critical method. 
this method goes by different names because this is not a standardized method. This is not a new method, by the way, but there has been no standardization. Perhaps standardization is not possible also because if you are dealing with different kinds of texts, the Bhagavad Gita is one kind of text, the Arthashastra is another kind of text. So you cannot think that we can use the same standardized method to all the texts. But there has been a lot of criticism of the method itself. This method reconstructs the history of a text using exclusively philological or linguistic criteria. Metlish uses different kinds of uh, features, identifying features like resegmentation of the text, the inclusion of colophones, chapter colophones, citations or apadesha, the deep structure text from which he recovers a, an organizational plan. I'm not going into the details because it's, it's very technical, but it is enough for us to know that the major criticism of this method is that it is purely conjectural. There is no way for somebody to verify uh, the conclusions. I mean, you can decipher a pattern maybe, but the existence of the pattern doesn't unequivocally point towards your conclusion. So this is a problem of this method. Then he, as I said, it uses philological criteria, that is criteria pertaining to language, but not pertaining to concepts. So that is also another problem. Now I'll uh, go, I'll conclude with his corollary arguments because based on this compositional history, he also has a lot of cor corollary arguments. He does refer to the conceptual point, not as his premise, but as his conclusion. We know that scholars so far have noted that there seems to be a tension in the Arthashastra. Times Kautilya seems to be a relentless political realist, <clears throat> giving a lot of freedom without limits to the king, not always taking into account what is uh, accepted by dharma. Again, at times he sounds orthodox, circumscribing the authority of the king to the mandate of dharma. Scholars have noted this tension. Now, Maclish's argument is that the compositional history that he is providing will help resolve this dilemma because there are two texts which were composed at two different eras. The earlier part, which is the Dandaniti, is a uh, more, uh, what should I say, liberal part, which gives a free hand to the king. The later part, which is the redacted part, was composed at a time when Brahminical Orthodox was uh, at a swing, and the redactor introduced passages which are orthodox, um, what should I say, clinging to what he calls the Varna Dharma. But Maklish himself admits that it's not that the Dandaniti did not subscribe to a Brahminical ideology. Maklish himself says that even both the texts has a subtext of Brahminical ideology. So it's not that one is a Brahminical text, the other is not. But the, the element of orthodoxy is more pronounced in what he identifies as the redaction. That is number one. The number two point that he says that he feels that this has a bearing on the debate on the relationship between religion and politics in classical India. Now, this is a deep terrain. Uh, there has been huge debates in the historiography of ancient Indian history that what exactly was the relationship between the state and religion. Unfortunately or fortunately, most of the times, I mean, definitely not fortunately, we have used a Western lens, perhaps, to study this question of the relationship between state and religion. I will flag it at that and conclude by one observation, which is that I'm very uncomfortable with Maclish's translation of the word dharma as sacred law. It is very confusing and misleading. It is true that law is one of the many meanings of the word dharma and also that it has a sacred origin, dharma has a sacred origin. But to translate dharma as sacred law in a world of today, which is defined in terms of the secular sacred divide, may not be a very intelligent thing to do. It can lead to a lot of other problems, theoretical problems. I'll conclude with this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arpita. I think uh, 
uh, in that brief uh, 10 minutes, uh, you have uh, very succinctly presented McLeish's argument. And uh, I could help thinking that uh, there may be some kind of a mischief uh, involved, deliberate mischief involved in, uh, also. But anyhow, we will come to the questions later. Uh, we will now uh, move on to our next uh, uh, session, and which is on the strategic uh, side of uh, Arthashastra. Our first speaker is uh, Professor Kajari Kamal from the Takshila Institution. 10 minutes, uh, ma'am. Yes, can you hear me? Dr. Komal, can you hear me? Um, doctor, just a second. Just give me a second to share my... Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Can you all see my screen? Is my screen viewable to everyone? No, we can't see it as yet. No. no. Okay, just a second. Yeah, now we can see it. Yeah, just a second. I'll just put it on the slideshow mode. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, can everyone see the screen now? Yes, we can, we can see the screen. Okay. Uh, so, um, respected chair, Sri S. Gurumurthy ji, uh, director of Vivekanand International Foundation, Dr. Arvind Gupta, uh, distinguished co-panelists and all those who have logged in from their homes, uh, a very good morning. Uh, at the outset, like um, I think uh, we need to thank Vivekanand International Foundation for this very. Doctor Kamal, we can't hear you. Uh, can I? Uh, is it better now if I just put the mic closer to my mouth? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Please do this. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, I'd just like to thank uh, WIF for doing this. I think it's a very laudable effort uh, to kind of take stock of uh, research on Kautilya Tarthashastra thus far. And more importantly, to try and brainstorm, uh, you know, uh, research avenues to take this uh, project meaningfully forward. Um, I firmly believe we do have a very long way to go. And um, uh, thank you for setting us on that path. Um, in my 10 minute presentation, and I hope the last two minutes are not counted in that 10 minutes, uh, I will be revisiting the strategic cultural debate. Now, um, Strategic culture and debate, uh, you know, always go hand in hand. There's uh, everything about strategic culture is debatable, uh, right from, you know, the st structural realist debate versus strategic culture. There's a big debate within the theorization of uh, strategic cultural theory with three generations of scholarship. Uh, uh, there's a very famous Johnston Gray debate going on. Uh, there's also a debate whether India has a strategic culture or not in the Indian context, and uh, importantly, whether um, India's strategic culture has anything to do with Kautilya's Arthashastra. And it is in this last area of debate that these two works uh, come into the spotlight. And um, as authors, we try and assess the importance Kautilya's Arthashastra has uh, or the extent to which it has lent itself to the framing of India's strategic culture. Now, both uh, Dr. Mitra and Dr. Lebig uh, you know, uh, have uh, convergences and divergences with my views on India's strategic culture uh, with the perspective uh, with respect to Kautilya's Arthashastra. So, in my presentation today, I'm going to just make it as one coherent narrative, uh, wherein I would try and bring out the convergences and the divergences as they come about. Uh, so, uh, very quickly, so that we're all on the same page, what do we mean by strategic culture? Um, very layperson understanding of strategic culture is that every state in the interstate system um, ought to respond to the external threat environment based on its resource capabilities, right? Now, in doing so, every state has a patterned way of responding. And that pattern can be seen as an orientation or an attitude or a predisposition or a proclivity, right? Now, each of these therefore makes the state's response not uniform with the others, 
but exclusive or unique. And that then is captured through the essence of strategic culture. Right now, why is there so much of debate about strategic culture for the simple reason that while this aspect of states having a unique patterned way of responding to external environment is self evident, uh, unfortunately, strategic culture is not empirically represented because you know it's ingrained in societal characteristics and behavior which really you can't uh, uh, you know pin uh, pinpoint and say that look this is because of the presence of this we have a strategic culture or because of the absence of that we do not have a strategic culture right and therefore there's so much of ambiguity about the whole concept of strategic culture now, Mitra and Lebeg also agree by and large with this understanding of what strategic culture is, which we just discussed in the previous slide. Uh, but I thought it's important to mention here that according to them, the ideational and the behavioral patterns are based on three distinct sources. Uh, one, according to them, is the collective experiences and memories. So strategic culture is born out of that. Uh, the other is a classical political strategic text, which they very clearly say is Kautilya's Arthashastra. And third is the sub semi consciously internalized set of ideas and values. Okay. Now, because they allude to the concept of strategic culture coming out from this diverse pool of resources, they end up saying that India's strategic culture is hybrid, right? And they uh, identify two endogenous and two exogenous uh, ideational inputs, which according to them leads to what they call strategic subculture, right? And the two endogenous ones being the Cotillion realist lineage and the Ashokan idealist lineage, and the ones which came from outside the Persian Muslim tradition, and of course, uh, the British inputs to India's strategic culture. Now, while they hold this at one end, they also, and this helps my case, uh, say this very categorically that uh, the dominant ideational strand. Uh, you know, continues to be that of Cotillion realism for, I think, reasons known to all of us present here today, right? That the Indian strategic community is the repository of latent Cotillion idea contents is what they contend, right? Now, if you look at very quickly the literature that has come up on India's strategic culture in the past now three decades, spurred uh, by <coughs> Tanham's essay in early 90s, it's a huge range of scholarship right from complete absence of strategic culture on one end uh, and these names by the way of authors only representative of the categories uh, they're not comprehensive by tanham who kind of was supported by k subramaniam then uh, to the complete other end which suggests that there is a vibrant india strategic culture proposed by kanti baj by rodney jones um, and their likes and there's this whole gray zone in between, which talks about a dualistic presence. So we also had Mitra and Leibig allude to this dualistic presence of Cotillion realists versus Gandhi and Ashokan, right? Now, two among these scholars mentioned here also say, which is a step ahead, that it's the idealist lineage that is used to camouflage the real politic lineage, right? So there's this whole concept of a veiled real politic, which India practices. There's a lot of scholars who actually believe in this. And uh, apart from the various strands um, of scholarship, what's also intriguing is that the methodology that they uh, have used for their respective uh, research projects, unfortunately, um, uh, does not lead to something, uh, you know, very conclusive. For instance, Kanti Bajpai has relied on uh, Alistair and Johnston's approach, uh, but does not uh, recognize Kautilya's Arthashastra as, uh, quote unquote, the object of analysis. He thinks it lacks, quote unquote, textual ri uh, richness and theoretical rigor. Right, so instead he looks at writings in the post independence era and tries to call out India's strategic culture. Uh, similarly, Rashid Zaman from a dualistic presence approach is actually, uh, you know, um, um, a Colin Gray student. So he follows the Gray's approach, but looks at Kautilya's Arthashastra as a very important, uh, having a very important input uh, to uh, India's strategic culture. Now, this, according to me, when I started out to do my research, was a perfectly fertile field to plant my own research, um, uh, both literally and metaphorically, because there was really nothing for certain that we knew about uh, India's strategic culture. And therefore, I uh, kind of followed the Johnston's conception of strategic culture. The scholar Alistair and Johnston uh, has done his work on China's strategic culture, and uh, he's absolutely rigorous as far as methodology is concerned in terms of definition, in terms of its output. So I found this entire positivist agenda of Johnston's methodology very appealing. 
especially because of the ambiguity around the term uh, strategic culture. So I took his definition, which essentially looks at strategic culture at two levels. One is the ideational level, which he calls the central strategic paradigm, which essentially has um, you know, answers to three, three questions, which I'm gonna take in a later slide. And flowing out from this basic assumption is uh, you know, the operational level, the grand strat uh, strategic level, right? So both these components then um, you know, form the whole that is strategic culture. He's very clear about sources and he looks at objects of analysis at the earliest point in history and nothing else, right? Uh, Gray, uh, on the other hand, looks at everything but the kitchen sink approach is uh, something which is used for Gray that, you know, he looks at all aspects of, uh, you know, historical experience, uh, colonial invasions, et cetera, et cetera. But Johnston is very clear about looking at one chief source. He's also very clear that culture has a definite influence on behavior to the extent that culture is an independent variable and behavior being a dependent variable, et cetera, et cetera. So everything about his approach was, uh, you know, uh, was with, uh, came out with a lot of clarity, which kind of appealed to me. So, uh, and fortunately, both Mitra and Lebeg in the book uh, that I'm covering today also say that to take Johnston's approach and apply it to India's strategic culture through Kautilya's Arthashastra, in their words, is a very fruitful research avenue. So that kind of uh, seconded uh, my, uh, my effort. Now, uh, for Johnston to call out a country's strategic culture, one has to follow three steps. The first step is divided into two parts, which essentially is to look at strategic culture from the text that you're studying, right? So you extrapolate this from this object of analysis, answers to these three questions, which forms that ideational input of strategic culture. And from there, then, you look at the grand strategic reference ranking. So this is 1A and 1B, which is essentially dealt with in my journal article. Step two is, as they say, the proof of the pudding is in its eating, is to see whether this grand strategic reference ranking actually plays out in the real world. That, you know, when strategic decision makers make a preference, it should match the preference ranking that you've culled out from your objective analysis. So uh, how did Kotila's Arthashastra fit as the object of analysis? Uh, it was a perfect fit in my view, because the four criteria laid down by Johnston to identify an object of analysis fit perfectly well with Kautilya's Arthashastra. It is written at the earliest point in history. It does not lie outside broader strategic philosophical framework. Uh, the text provides a textual and intellectual basis for much of the writings on military affairs to follow. And definitely, I, in my view, text is a complete magnum opus as far as grand strategy is concerned. So in all these four important ways, Kautilya's Arthashastra then became my object for analysis. Now, I set out then to ask these three questions of the text. So you have to study the text, find out 1A and 1B from the text, and then go on to step two, right? Now, the first question uh, of the central strategic paradigm was, what is the role of war for Kautilya in his Arthashastra? Now, uh, the fact that, you know, we have Yoga Kshema, which enjoys the ruler to curb Matsinyai, we have, uh, the concept of war so very well dealt in the text. Uh, we're all familiar with the kind of, uh, you know, a vocabulary on a war that comes out from the text. I concluded that uh, for Cotillia, war was an inevitable phenomenon. The second question was, what is the nature of adversary, right? And um, I hope, the, uh, I wish Deepshika was here, her article uh, uh, sums up this answer, that there's a whole gradation of neighborhood, right? From Right from a natural enemy at one end to a friendly neighbor, to a vassal state. So there's a whole gradation of neighborhood. And while there was a lot of emphasis on relative power and, you know, uh, bringing about your, uh, training your troops with respect to enemy troops, et cetera, et cetera, um, enemy's disposition, its geographical location, there were various factors involved in deciphering who was your natural enemy and who was your friend. So there were times when relationship between states would tend towards a zero-sum game. And the third important question that I asked of the text was, what is the efficacy of violence? Now, while Cotillia is a political realist, and we all know that, and he uh, obviously knew the utility of the use of force, but you'd all agree with me when I say that for him, war was to be used as a last resort, that he did play a lot of emphasis and uh, said that, you know, mantra shakti, trumps prabhava shakti, utsa shakti, there are various references to war being used only as a last resort for obvious reasons of Kshay, where Pravas, right? So then, therefore, according to Cotillia, war is to be used as a last resort. Now, Johnson, being a Western scholar, had 
Endesage that if war is a recurrent phenomena and relations tend towards zero sum, then the third logical corollary then would be use of superior force. And that's where uh, Kautilya's Arthashastra defies the norm and says that no. So even though war is recurrent, even though relations may sometimes tend towards zero sum, war is still used, supposed to be used as the last resort. Now, this was the ideational aspect of the concept of strategic culture. Flowing out from it is the grand strategic preference ranking. So given your understanding of this objective environment in the manner strategic uh, uh, paradigm discussed, how would you rank your strategic preferences? And uh, I won't go into the details, but I could take it up as questions later. According to me, the grand preference ranking was accommodation first, defense second, and offense third, right? Now, if you see, there is this congruence between this ideational and operational aspect of strategic culture within the text, right? So if war is inevitable and adversary is all tends, sometimes tends towards zero sum, force is to be used as a last resort. And if force is to be used as a last resort, offensive becomes your least preferred strategic uh, option, grand strategic option. Now, because of this congruence in the text, I conclude that yes, there is a deep-rooted, consistent set of assumptions within the text, which can be seen as, uh, you know, alluding to the concept of strategic culture. But in the process of my research, I also realized that the process of arriving at grand strategy was quite similar to that of structural realism. And that's ironical because the whole theory of strategic culture came up with the realist theory as the edifice of target. That, you know, there was this softer dimension to every state's action in the interstate system, which kind of undercut the, 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 the structure of the interstate system, which the structural realists laid a lot of emphasis on. So yes, according to Kautilya, and we all know of Dravya Prakritis and Raja Prakritis in the Mandala system, where calculation of expected utility of different strategies in the light of available resources and capabilities was definitely considered, right? The Saptanga theories is all about that. Then how is Kautilya different? And how is the realism in the text different from that of Western realism? And I conclude then that there is this very strong a normative dimension which filters the objective indicators that any effective statecraft needs to take into cognition, which is essentially the welfare of the people. There is this set of very core philosophical ethical principles which constrain the effects this environmental factor has on national security policy making. And that is something which is unique to the text. That is something which, in my view, is unique to India's strategic culture. And therefore, it's term, being termed as realism plus, it came up in one of uh, the lectures by a former NSA, Shiv Shankar Menon, is really the Indian realist tradition. Now, the way forward for me, and I've uh, uh, been through steps two and three, but I haven't, uh, you know, uh, apprised you about those. Uh, step one, A and B, is covered in the journal article that I was supposed to talk to you all about today. Step two, then, is... Johnston says that because you've de deciphered the ideational and operational inputs in one text in one strategic context, you need to look at another document, another text in another strategic con uh, context and find out the additional, uh, the, the ideational and the operational inputs and see to what extent do they tally with the ones present in your object of analysis. And for step two, I've looked into the draft nuclear doctrine and the India's nuclear doctrine that came up a few years later. And I found the CSP and the Grand Strategic Preference Ranking to be congruent even there, just as it was in Kautilya's Arthashastra. And step three is then to establish the existence of Indian, India's strategic culture and the influence that it has on strategic behavior. And for that, I for my thesis, which hopefully we should come out in the form of a book sometime soon, I've looked at India's bilateral relations with the US, China, and Pakistan um, in this Kautilyan framework that I've culled out from the text and have, I think, I would hope, uh, sufficiently proven that Kautilya's Arthashastra um, has really lent to uh, what we can, you know, uh, call the existence, a vibrant existence of India's strategic culture. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, very clear uh, presentation. And I think uh, the conclusions that you drew and which you mentioned in the last few slides are uh, uh, very interesting and uh, uh, worth uh, pondering over that uh, Western, uh, that Indian realism is uh, very different from uh, Western realism. And uh, I think yesterday what uh, Prime Minister talked about the values, etc. So it has, this, you know, it has, to, it, Indian realism is rooted in uh, uh, much larger uh, human values. So I think that is one point which comes out. 
and the second point is uh, which is uh, that uh, <coughs> the orthashastra is very much a, a strategic uh, document and inf and it informs uh, indian thinking uh, even today and uh, your work uh, is also important because uh, it has some very practical uh, uh, implications because you are looking at how patel informs the india's nuclear doctrine or uh, its relations with the major powers etc so we look forward to uh, your work thank you very much for that uh, presentation and now uh, we move on to uh, uh, dr saurav mishra who is uh, associate professor at the mit yeah. saurav can you do it in about 10 minutes so we are running out of time yes sir yes sir i'll be very brief with regard to that uh... Yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, and I'm supposed to. And uh, thank you uh, to Viveka and International Foundation for inviting me uh, to discuss uh, uh, very erudite Dr. Meera Bish, who herself is present here. And uh, the title of his uh, book is Kautilya's Art Shastra: Philosophy of Strategy. So, uh, yes, uh, we need to set the context first because uh, this book is not without a context and we have been looking at this uh, and we were waiting for the book to come out uh, for a long time uh, because when we initiated uh, the project on kautilya shastra she was one of the uh, volunteers uh, who actually uh, uh, took up the issue and uh, you see the product is here and uh, we need to discuss uh, uh, this book in that requirement which we uh, had at that point of time when we initiated the project. Actually, uh, what we know today uh, is like there are two waves of uh, Kautilian studies in India, uh, which uh, I can uh, means actually clearly identify. Uh, the first one, uh, which began in the early 19th and uh, early 20th century, uh, uh, from the discovery of the text, or to say rediscovery of the text, and the other one is uh, what we see uh, as. Uh, in our contemporary recent days, uh, which actually began, which actually begun uh, in the uh, uh, second decade of uh, uh, the 21st century, with the uh, uh, I say the uh, pioneering of uh, uh, the uh, movement by Colonel P. G. Gautam, who is also available here in amongst us. So, what was the context that uh, uh, actually? Uh, because I'm privy to uh, Dr. Meida's uh, uh, evolution. Uh, uh, what actually was the context uh, was the uh, basic uh, allegation that India has no strategic thinking. It, it happened in 1990 with Tanem's thesis, uh, uh, which came out from RAN. So there were various responses, uh, uh, and uh, Mr. K. Subramaniam uh, agreed to uh, kind of uh, means the thesis that Tanem proposed that India has no strategic thinking. In fact, we need to note here that thinking and the culture are quite different things, but still uh, thinking and cultures are related to each other, uh, we find that. And that's why the uh, uh, context is important for us uh, in terms of uh, strategy, development in India, evolution of a strategy in India, and actually to speaking, the philosophy of a strategy in India. Because yes, he was talking about, Ms. Tana was talking about thinking, that's why uh, we need to explore the philosophy itself. There are several responses to his uh, thesis. Uh, of course, uh, Deepshika was supposed to be here. Uh, her response is, uh, uh, is quite uh, uh, important for us. But equally important here is the other part, because Deepshika was discussing uh, Aya theory in the context of Aya theory. What Veda does is directly taking up, uh, she is taking up the issue of a strategy from the philosophical point of view. Why? Because there were questions uh, which were persisting from the very first wave of Kautilya studies itself. And that was about uh, what uh, is the philosophical standing of uh, the Kautilya text or the Arthashastra. Because there were various strands of philosophies, visible allegations of uh, the text being incoherent, and have uh, of uh, incoherent and having no values, the practical uh, practical uh, values and uh, utility. So uh, this question uh, was not answered till uh, 
until the second wave came up. I'll be very sure about it, uh, and I'm quite sure about it. Why? Because uh, people were looking at the text from the Western given perspectives, specifically realist perspective. Nobody was exploring further because that was the accepted legitimate narrative about Arthashastra. Now, what happens with this book by Dr. Maida? Dr. Maida is actually giving her narrative or how he sees, how she, she sees Kautilya as a coherent political strategic thinker. And that coherence comes from the study of the philosophy that he actually follows in writing the whole text. The uh, origin of the text, the uh, various parts, redaction, the, uh, the uh, base text, all these are kinds of uh, 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 means uh, debates in different dimensions that we want to go into. Uh, actually, we want to into the, go into the practical dimension of the debate. That is strategy. And that here uh, we can do by only uh, not going into the abstract debates or uh, uh, sometimes the philological debates. What we are looking here is at the idea content of the Arthashastra. Or what Dr. Mehta specifically is looking at the idea content means the uh, content that is relevant and that has in fact influenced the Indian thinking through uh, uh, throughout a period of time. And if we, and if we can identify the history also, uh, it goes uh, 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 to certain uh, uh, period uh, in which we can identify uh, easily uh, which uh, through various uh, other available texts. Uh, while the text of Arthashastra was not available, but the other uh, texts were all available which belong to the Arthashastra tradition. And I use the term tradition here because Dr. Medha, in fact, studied the Arthashastra from the philosophical tradition point. Means the text as a tradition, not uh, as like uh, some uh, text which has evolved over a period of time. Yes, everything evolves, but the point here is to look at the basics of that tradition and find out how that is interplaying with our thinking and in our strategic formulation and making. So uh, that is the context uh, that the book has. And uh, uh, she has beautifully elaborated uh, her viewpoints uh, uh, in her book. So she herself says that uh, uh, there are various purposes uh, which actually uh, uh, Full, uh, means uh, she wants to achieve uh, uh, various objectives through these books. And uh, this is like, uh, she herself says that uh, she's seeking to emancipate concepts familiar to non-Western space and therefore not an attempt to create alternative theories of the world. Yes, she says that. Uh, and she this says that, uh, and, and this statement actually acknowledges the very fact that we are living in the contemporary world with given ideas in a given context and they themselves are the reality for us and we may not be negating that actually we have to live with that not only live with that but actually has to adapt them in our traditions with our traditions and our tradition and uh, uh, the uh, traditions that we have adopted over the uh, uh, times, means uh, uh, over the colonial periods, so they interact with each other uh, and they can be both looked together as constitutive in nature rather than, mean, rather than being uh, competitive uh, or uh, something else like uh, And she rejects this, non, uh, this binary of uh, Western and non-Western uh, categories, uh, uh, means uh, of knowledge production. Knowledge is fun. And, and we also uh, have noticed that uh, the Arthashastra itself has lots of interaction with uh, various cultural spaces. So uh, her taking the whole world as one and uh, rejecting the non -bi uh, the binary nature of Western and non-Western is quite important to be noticed over here. So she also says that she wants to end endow agency to non-West in the history of ideas. Why agency? Because we know that the politics of knowledge has, in fact, uh, eliminated the agency of the non-West, and that's why we need to re means need to recapture or uh, re acknowledge what the non-West has contributed to the whole world, and that is the purpose. One of the purpose of the book. 
and she highlights the necessity of exploring the constitutive nature of the state, power, morality, and order. That's a very important call from the point of uh, the uh, Cotillion uh, uh, text. Uh, she is very clear that she says that uh, uh, the legacy of dharma as a concept beyond dharma shastra. I mean, she takes the legacy of dharma as concept beyond artha shastra, and she actually identifies, integrates, and explains also how dharma is there evident in the text of the artha shastra, and in fact, it becomes the key for the order of the system, which she later. Uh, 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 explains and defines, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll say that is the major contribution that she is making to the uh, uh, this whole gamut of uh, the literature on Arthashastra that uh, we are having these days. I'll discuss that later in, in a few moments. So uh, the structure of the book itself is important to see because she has divided it into three parts, and that is the first part is to identify the uh, uh, or situate the text of the Arthashastra as a text on philosophy and strategy. The first thing. The second part, in the second part of the book, book she explores the feasible and desirable in the Arthashastra. This is like uh, the debate between is and not, what is feasible and what is desirable. And she uh, extensively uh, deliberates on the fundamental concepts of Matsunyaya, Yoga, Kshema, uh, the, what is political, the definition of the political itself, and uh, how uh, that actually is uh, 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 related to the contemporary uh, theories as well, and how dharma becomes the key to uh, the solution or maintenance of the order uh, in the uh, international uh, or even in the uh, uh, domestic uh, affairs. So in the third part, she uh, derives some learnings from the Arthashastra and she reflects on the philosophy of statecraft and theory. This is the uh, division that and uh, the uh, way she, uh, she has discussed the content of the Arthashastra uh, in her book. Uh, from my perspective, the most important contribution of the book uh, here is first. Can you hear me? Hello? Saurabh? There's some problem there. Arpita, would you please like to find out? Yes. But I think he was almost converting. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Saurav, are you there? Yeah. Please go ahead. This is about We can't really hear you. I think you'll have to now confirm. We can't, we can't really hear you. Yeah. Your connection is quite bad. Sorry, your voice is breaking, so we can't uh, make out. Hello? Maybe you could come back uh, in the QA later. Uh, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, please conclude now. Yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Just, I'm just concluding with two points that uh, there are two unique contributions that uh, Dr. Mira has uh, made her in her book. First, the uh, discussion of Cotillia's thinking, the uh, ways of thinking, applying uh, 
uh, various uh, strategies and uh, using various means uh, in the framework of ends, means, and uh, ends, ways, and means debate, uh, which is uh, actually considered as a Western perspective, but yes, actually, that is there in the Arthashastra. So that contribution of explaining the whole text in that framework is notable. And this is uh, quite important uh, from our perspective of studying this strategy. So the other important thing or uh, the contribution by Dr. Meda here is, uh, means explaining the whole text, thinking uh, the strategic explained by uh, strategies uh, adopted and explained by Kautilya's Arthashastra, uh, in the systems framework taken by or pro uh, pro means propounded by uh, Robert Kaplan. So she actually uh, uh, tries to look at the text of the Arthashastra in a very scientific framework. That is the systems framework. And this helps locating the Arthashastra in the gamut of the intellectual of uh, 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 traditions that are quite scientific or that claim uh, themselves to be scientific. And that's why we identify here uh, using the systems approach, which Dr. Meda uh, extensively explains uh, 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 using the concepts of uh, the Arthashastra as a, a very important contribution. The final thing is the order. She, in fact, uh, is seems to be fascinated by the term order, and she uh, will explain uh, in her talk maybe why. Uh, because I identify various reasons for, uh, because that is important for the maintenance of the system, that is important for the uh, 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 ends, ways, and means approach. And order, in fact, she equates somehow with uh, dharma, and I expect uh, that she'll be deliberating on that also. Okay. So that was all from my side, what I read from uh, her book. And uh, uh, that is a must for uh, uh, the uh, students and teachers, to scholars, uh, to read uh, this book if they want to uh, uh, locate uh, uh, the whole discourse uh, in the modern contemporary uh, uh, intellectual traditions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Saurabh, for uh, explaining what the book is all about. But now let's uh, turn to the author herself. And see what she has to say. Meda, welcome to this to the VIF. I think this is the first time. Yes. 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 So go ahead. Ten minutes. Yeah. So thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Gupta. I think it's been wonderful seeing you. Um, also, thank to, thanks to your team, Dr. Arpita, for inviting me. I think it was really a delight for me to, in fact, engage with the book and also establish a conversation uh, with it. Uh, so first of all, unfortunately, Dr. Deepshika Shahi is not here, but uh, felicitations to her. Um, it's a wonderful book, primarily because it fills an important gap in the discipline. And I uh, say this for two reasons. You know, first, it uh, intends to theorize Arthashastra. I think that's very important. And um, second, but more importantly, you know, there is where I think, uh, you know, the sense of the book lies. Uh, she is able to establish a conversation between Arthashastra and some of the recent developments in the discipline of, of, of international relations. So to start with, it's definitely a very just endeavor. And I say this because, uh, uh, you know, one of our primary premises is that you need to engage philosophy and we all know that Indian philosophy is layered it is profound it is deep but having said that I feel she has been able to wade her way away uh, very effectively now um, let me just come uh, to uh, you know her primary entry point and I thought you know perhaps uh, uh, people for, for listeners who've not read the book you know it will be helpful to understand you know where is it that uh, Deepshika is really entering, uh, you know, this uh, uh, this uh, this canvas where she can establish a conversation between Arthashastra and international relations uh, theory. You know, she is bri primarily um, advancing this proposition that Arthashastra is an eclectic text, which means that uh, as a text, it reconciles rationalist uh, rationalist 
thinking with reflectivist thinking. So this rationalist thinking and reflectivist thinking, I think, is very important because through this, she's actually positioning herself in the fourth great debate. Uh, you know, in international relations. And that, I would say, uh, she considers to be uh, one of her uh, primary, uh, um, uh, you know, contribution. Because it is here that, you know, uh, uh, the fourth debate, uh, just to give you a, a brief backdrop, you know, when you look at the great debates in international relations, there are two views. So there are one set of scholars who say that the great debates are, are useless. You know, they don't tell us anything about international relations. It's a great myth. But there is this alternative. <laughs> says that in fact great debates are very useful because what they do is that they help you to explore the philosophy of social science um, and uh, this philosophy of social science I would say is uh, very relevant to understand the discipline of international relations. In other words they say that the great debates are very important because it really helps you to understand how knowledge is produced and it is here I think Deepshika is entering in, entering in because she is getting the fourth debate here and she's saying that because the fourth debate actually you know bridges uh, the gap between the reflectivist and the rationalist debate uh, you know Arthashastra definitely makes sense to the discipline of international relations uh, just to uh, you know uh, say uh, you know like sort of reiterate this the third debate really talked about the incommensurability of paradigms and here she is really talking about the fourth debate which actually brings together the rationalist, the reflectivist tradition, the positivist, uh, the post-positivist tradition. So what I'm going to do today is that I'm going to uh, anchor my discussion perhaps on two pillars. Um, the first will be that I'll be just be flagging off because I don't have much time um, on some of the main arguments she raises in the chapters. But secondly, I will also try to critically engage given, you know, given with these arguments, given my own reading of Arthashastra. And I wish she was here because, you know, there are a couple of questions which I have for her. So, um, you know, in the first chapter itself, she's looking at the philosophical roots, uh, which she says is, are very important for understanding Arthashastra because they really help us to theorize it. And, uh, and, and given that, you know, the philosophical underpinnings of Arthashastra have been ignored to a great extent, um, you know, Arthashastra as a text has been misinterpreted. So in order to uncover the philosophical leanings, she in fact looks at the Sankhya, the uh, Yoga and the Lokayat philosophy. And then she introduces this term extra political realist elements, which she says is very important. Now, to my mind, you know, her, um, her, her focus on these uh, on the, the, the extra political realist element that she calls in, or the Sankhya, the, Lok, uh, the Lokayat and the Yoga tradition is very important because it raises certain metaphoric, uh, sorry, meta theoretical questions. And uh, to just sort of, you know, say a few lines on this theory is different from meta theory. You know, theory can be constitutive, theory can be explanatory, theory can be descriptive, uh, theory can be critical. But meta theory is very important because the meta theory actually under, uh, you know, uh, looks at the underlying assumptions which are embedded in the theory itself. So in a way, Meta theory helps in the act of theorizing itself. And um, I think, uh, you know, uh, when she's looking at the Sankhya, the Lokayat, and the uh, Yoga tradition, uh, she is, in fact, you know, paving her way to um, uh, uh, frame uh, or uh, perhaps to articulate uh, Arthashastra as a constructivist. I'll come uh, to it later when I come to her fourth chapter, the third and the fourth chapter. But I have a simple question to Dr. Deep Shikha. I totally agree that, you know, it's an eclectic text. It has it brings in the reflectivist and the rationalist tradition together. You know, my question to her is that why is she really skeptic of putting Weber into a normative category? And I think it's very important because, yes, Weber is indifferent to evaluative judgments. But Max Weber, at the same time, he's defining science not through its method, but he's defining science on the basis of the goal. So Weber says, you know, social science is a thoughtful ordering of empirical reality. So you see a teleology here. You see a purpose here. For Weber, the state is a purpose actor, and so for Cotelia. You know, uh, the, the task of the Cotelia is to regulate order. And that order is coming from this cosmic understanding of dharma, which is to hold together. And um, and it's here that I see, uh, you know, a, a faint resemblance of, of Cotelia's Arthashastra with the, uh, with the classical realism of, of Hans Morgenthau. Because Morgenthau himself is also influenced by Weber. And therefore, when Morgenthau is really talking about, uh, you know, balance of power in the system, he's talking about how do you actually maintain order? How do you actually maintain equilibrium in the system? So, you know, uh, there is a reflexivity here. There is a judgment here where you, don't, where you want to actually minimize the anarchical aspects 
of the international system. But still, you know, having said this, I wouldn't box Cotelia into a realist category, and maybe I'll talk about it later. Um, and therefore, I'm also com uncomfortable in a way of, uh, you know, boxing uh, Cotelia uh, either in a theoretical strand or either in, in, in any approach. Now, the second chapter, interestingly, explains the building blocks, you know, where she might be looking at blocks for theorizing Arthashastra. And um, she further really dwells into the Sankhya, the Yoga, and the Yogayat philosophy. And uh, the key question for her is that how is it that the Sankhya, the Yoga, and the Logayat philosophy reconcile the reflectivist and the rationalist tradition? Now, I think, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, important for her because it helps her to tease out, you know, the extra political realist element. I think what Kajri was talking about as realist plus. And this is also very distinct epistemic practice. So it is here, I think, you know, we need to look at Cortelia. What is the epistemic contribution Cortelia is really making to the discipline, not only of international relations, but to social science in general. And uh, the value, in fact, which I draw, you know, from uh, this, uh, in fact, really differs, uh, you know, from uh, Dr. Shahi's understanding, because I really believe that the invocation of Sankhya the yoga and the lokayat is urging us to look at the phenomena or the reality outside in a holistic perspective. And um, I think, uh, you know, that's important. You know, it's also because Anvikshiki, um, uh, you know, constitutes of three sciences. And he says that Anvikshiki is the lamp of all sciences. So Patelia, in fact, is telling us to have some critical skepticism when, again, we are looking at, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the issues around when we're observing the reality. And I think this is one of the main reasons as to three contradictory logics, the yoga, the lokayat, and the Sankhya tradition are built up together. So, you know, I would say here that Sankhya for me, definitely, there is a dual. But as much as I think, you know, what Sankhya is telling us is that it is telling us to have a discerning eye, a discerning eye towards balancing the material and the spiritual aspects. You know, not really go by the objective reality, but look at certain unobservables which are there. Because it's the amalgamation of the Purush and the Prakriti which gives a birth to a new entity. Yoga, on the other hand, is about self-discipline. It's really about uh, disciplining yourself. It's a meditative practice. Primarily talking about human nature. You know, how do you control human nature? Gandhi talked about it. Because Gandhi said that, you know, human nature is has an upward thing and it has a lower uh, downward thing. And he said that, you know, you need to actually discipline yourself. And, uh, you know, that is why he got the, uh, the idea of Charkha there. So, um, and that's very important in Arthashastra too. So it is here that I think Arthashastra is very different from classical realism because it's not really taking human nature as deterministic. And finally, in the Lokaya tradition is the Charvak philosophy. Which is the materials, the empirical, uh, the, the, the empirical and the positivist uh, sort of an understanding which really comes from it. So there is a rationalist angle to it, but yes, there is a reflectivist angle to it also. Now, I would say that the third chapter, you know, um, is her empirical chapter. This is well written. Uh, very good because here is where she's actually foregrounding it, uh, you know, in the Mauryan Empire. I think she's really filled in the gap uh, by really looking at it historically. Um, and I think that this is one of the most original contribution of the book also. So uh, I don't have much to say about this, but perhaps I'll come to this chapter when I go into the fourth chapter. Because in the fourth chapter, she's getting into a very interesting argument. In the first chapter, she's picking up that very argument which she introduces in the first chapter, where she says that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Cortelli actually makes contribution to the fourth debate. And it is here in the fourth debate that she is placing constructivism as an approach because she says that constructivism is a middle ground theory and as, uh, as an, uh, a middle ground approach. And as an approach, it can reconcile the rationalist and the reflectivist tradition. Now, I was really trying to understand the reason for this. And I was like, why is it that she really, you know, like books on constructivism? Because I had a different understanding of it, you know, because I was, of course, I had read a lot on grand strategy and I saw it as a strategic test. Of course, uh, you know, there were questions on theory which came to my mind, but uh, and particularly when you're looking at the philosophical theory. There needs to be another book for that Chika has come up with this book. So I was trying to understand as to why she is leading towards Anstrada. I thought that perhaps the reason is because she wants to come out with some key principles uh, which can help her theorize Arthashastra. You know, but 
But taking a step back, my question to her again is that when you are getting into the domain of meta theory, why talk about constructivism? Why not critical realism? And critical realism, she mentions, but critical realism, I think, is very important because what critical realism is saying is that it's really talking about these unobservable elements in explaining state behavior or explaining a phenomena. And critical realism also tries to reconcile the positivist and the post positivist tradition. And in fact, scholars have written that critical realism, which really reconciles the positivist and the interpretist tradition, you know, can be considered as the, as, as, as the fourth debate. Now, the second, I would say, the second uh, particular sort of question, you know, which I have for her is that, you know, she's calling a Cortelia consequentialist. Cortelia is too interested in means. But well, you know, I would say that, is that really true? Because I feel that Cortelia is a grand theorist. He's a categorical categorialist. Of course, you know, he, uh, um, he is uh, talking about certain means. His end purpose is a yoga shema, that is the happiness of the people, but there is a rationale to that. You know, there's a rationale to that because he is actually raising this point, you know, the order or the happiness of people can only be maintained when dharma is there and how can dharma be maintained? Dharma or order slash order can only be maintained when the king does his duty, one, and second, uh, even the people do their duty. So I would say that, you know, when you talk about grand strategy, the purpose becomes very important. And the purpose definitely here is maintaining order because anyone who is a threat to the order is the enemy of the state. Uh, so, you know, this is something which I have to say, but then quickly, um, I would say that, uh, you know, um, the meta theoretical understanding of Arthashastra, I think will be well placed if you talk about critical um, realism, because uh, this can give us some flexibility in terms of you know, talking about either a constructivist approach or a systems approach, or even I would say the English school, you know, which necessarily is talking about order or which is necessarily talking about a minimum solidarity amongst actors, and that is there. Um, so finally, I would you know, conclude by saying that, you know, why, why try to fit IR, uh, you know, why try to fit Arthashastra into IR after all? You know, the worldview, as I understand it, from Arthashastra, it is telling us to look at things in a holistic manner. It is telling us to look at things in a networked manner, in a web and uh, so the primary and uh, you know the entry points for further research then becomes you know who is connected to what how is it connected uh, uh, how is it connected to what extent it is connected and who is connected to whom and you know I'll just give you a small example and then I'll, I'll perhaps uh, you know close uh, 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 my presentation you know if you look at uh, alliances in Arthashastra and I think that's you know very very typical of network analysis he's talking not only about the human alliances but he's also talking about the non-human alliances and therefore one has to really take care of the weather patterns one has to really take care of the topography the geography and all of that you know he's really talking about not only uh, uh, you know the state but the protection of the natural environment and i think that is the worldview which is coming from Arthashastra, a holistic worldview you know binding it to a particular approach or paradigm i think does injustice uh, to to this classic text so uh, thank you so much and i'll close here thank you thank you Meza. And I think your uh, conclusion is absolutely apt. Uh, even these uh, four debates uh, in international relations theory, as you yourself said, that there is a lot of uh, debate on that itself, whether they're useful or uh, not. And even the Western thinking, in Western thinking, and I would subscribe to that, these are more or less useless debates. They really don't add very much. Of course, you can pick up a few things about definitions, and uh, but that's really Western thinking. Here is a text which has evolved much before the Western text, and you are using those approaches to uh, a totally different milieu. So whether you will ever be able to deconstruct uh, the Arthashastra by using Western tools and methodologies, I think is a question. And you, as you yourself pointed out, Arthashastra is much wider. I mean, it says the context is much wider. It is holistic. It is, you know, value-based, whereas uh, that is not the case uh, with the Western theories. So I think we might uh, lose our way uh, if we start applying uh, the uh, Western tools and the methodologies to, and that could be one of my criticism of all the works that have been uh, discussed here. But we are again trying and uh, trying to uh, decipher uh, Arthashastra uh, again from a Western lens, uh, which may be useful for uh, a good uh, PhD or a MPhil, but whether it really adds to anything uh, to our knowledge is a question mark. But anyway, I leave it to you. So, okay, now we go to. Uh, Colonel Gautam, who has uh, been mentioned many times, 
are here. So, Colonel Gautam, over to you. 10 minutes, please. Hello? Yes, please. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can okay. hear you. Okay. Firstly, uh, thank you, Dr. Arvind Gupta and Arpita Mitra for organizing this event and sending the list which I sent to various invitees, which I must identify. Professor Jerky Kokunen and his student Marcos from Finland are attending. Admiral Nirmal Verma, Commodore Sachin More, uh, Vishnu Saxena, and Rajna Srivastav and Tarun Kumar. These are the other resource persons who are attending. Fantastic. And they're all, they're all interested in this. So I'll quickly come to the uh, what aims we had set out earlier when the project started. In volume one, there were three goals. Arvind Gupta was the DG. He said, bring together scholars has been achieved. And next book is by Kadri Kamal and Saurabh. Second is to establish India's long tradition of strategic thinking. I think it's been done quite well now. And third is to, uh, you know, to study original literature, Panchatantra and Tirukural and regional. There we are lacking totally. And then four themes identified were foreign policy, intelligence, war, and internal security. I think they have been well done. And on its own, global IR, comparative perspective, philosophy, and Vikshiki has come to light. And philosophy, my dear, six schools of Indian philosophy certainly have found a great sort of. Uh, importance all of us are talking about Sankhya Yoga, Mimansa, etc. God or no God. So that is quite interesting. In volume two, three layers were identified for the project. One is academics. That is the top layer. I think it is well done. The extinct species can be seen on the screen. Second is the practitioners. Oh, I'm not impressed at all by the policy makers. Nothing. Zero. And third is popular level. The Kotali has been vandalized. Totally vandalized at the popular level. Anyway, we are the extinct species, so let me be at the academic level. In volume two in appendix A, 24 research questions were listed out. Most of them have been addressed. However, I'll, three of them are yet to be addressed. First is diplomatic history. Forget ancient political history, even World War II onwards, our archives are not available. So what, uh, how can you relate modern, you know, statecraft to quotidian ideas if your diplomatic and military history is not in open access? Second is three crore Sanskrit manuscripts are rotting. And it was, we have a sem seminar last week. It has not been analyzed in Sanskrit only, three crore. So probably Sankhya philosophy is lying out there. All those 13 ancient Arthashastra teachers are lying there. So who's sitting on it? Who's hiding it? I don't know. Still nothing has happened. Third was book 15. Now, book 15 has not been analyzed properly. Those 32 devices, they exist in uh, Charak Samita, Shishur Samita, and Tolka Payam. So that needs to be done. And uh, there's an exuberance in presentism. Totally present. Yeah, to today, this happened. Uh, what will Gautelia say? I mean, that's, come on. I mean, that is, I think, the limit. The scholars, uh, I think, Presentism is a problem. So people expect immediate answers. So that is the negative I found. So last question is, of the research question identified was most important. That is, what can the Arthashastra contribute to peace research and conflict prevention? Oof, nothing has happened. This was a question in the book. And uh, uh, Medha Bis in her last sentence has said, that the future research should be on not only four upayas of Kautilya, but upaya Kaushalya of Buddha, of Buddhism. So I think that is the future. Okay. So what has happened is stuck that we are in the scientific theory or positivism of Western Aya, Western original Aya, which of course has roots in India. We are stuck. And the moral argument, which most of the authors are bringing out, is still not, has not risen. So, what should we say? Should Indic traditions reinforce political realism? And seeing the behavior of world politicians today, I'm quite disheartened. I mean, COVID has happened. Uh, we thought world leaders will rise up. And look at the way they are behaving. So should political realism extracted from one strand of Patalia reinforce this problem when there is a climate change about to come, more pandemics about to come, and there's a social sort of disparity between our own population? 
You don't need artificial, artificial intelligence to find out about migrant labor and poverty and suffering. So Kautilya Arshas has to then now upgrade itself and go beyond this in Yoga Shema. And if we don't impress the global, global discourse, then there is no point studying Kautilya. So that's the forthcoming challenge for scholars. However, the tools would be the bureaucracy, the state craft, the academics, the political class, no doubt about it. Tools would remain the same, but the ideas have to generate. So otherwise, there's no point saying that probably Kautilya is uh, for six, fifth century BC. So what? Subramaniam had, had a point. He said it's 2,500 old. So what? So I think Subramaniam wanted to just tell you to come to the present, use your wisdom, but address problems of today and tomorrow. Finally, I need to share my understanding of scholarship, which is very important. There are two types of scholars. One are those commanding generals of World War I who sat behind in the chateaus, ordering troops to battle and not seeing the battlefield at all. In fact, they were, they were in tears in the end of World War I. Yet this is the way troops fought. So th these are the scholars who say, our Shastra should be done. And then they sit back, they are very happy. And they quote in parliament or you know, somewhere, Ad Shastra hona chahiye. But the real foot infantry soldiers are these scholars who are sitting here today, who have slogged and slogged and will continue to, who are dreaming of it, who are buying books, who are going out of the way to get the discourse. So these second type are the real uh, foot soldiers of this uh, project. And over three dozen scholars have already interlinked with the project which started with IDSA. Of course, there are many more scholars, so that's a good thing. So they have to engage in combat. So don't sit in way behind in shadow and say, do this, do that, do it yourself. If you want to be the change, do it yourself. That's what Gandhi said. So hats off to my scholars and all our scholars who have done this work and much more is to be done. So I have finished, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh... Gautam for that uh, giving us a sense of way forward and uh, you would remember that uh, one of our uh, aims was to uh, use uh, develop the understanding of uh, Arthashastra and use it as a tool for uh, solving today's problems. So that challenge uh, is uh, still there. So it has two aspects. First we have to understand it and then we have to start applying it. So maybe the application part is perhaps uh, to be addressed. So thank you very much. I think uh, uh, now we have come to uh, uh, the, uh, all this uh, <laughs> presentations are over. And now I turn to uh, Shri Guru Murthy Ji, the chairman of the VIF to kindly make his uh, uh, remarks, sum it up, give us uh, some further directions. And then maybe we can have uh, uh, some uh, little bit of Q and A if uh, the time is there. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. And uh, I have been a great beneficiary going through the work and the presentations of the scholars. I am no scholar. I am not a strategic thinker. But I think about strategic thinkers. Because strategic thinking in the sense in which it is being understood today has very grave importance for all nations, and particularly a country like India. Because strategic thinking is now driven by adversaries. It is not merely an idea a society generates on its own. It's a responsive science. So, when we talk about strategic culture of India, as I see it, strategic culture in the sense in which how to manage intellectual conflicts, we had mastered it. Intellectual conflicts are the very source of physical conflicts. If you look at the history of the world about violence, uh, I think some kind of an interdisciplinary study is needed because one of the scholars said that the role of violence is very important in the strategic response to it. 
if you look at violence that has taken place all over the world, the most crucial study was done by Professor Ramli of Hawaii University, who did 30 years research tracking violence in the history of the world for the last 2,500 years and found that till about the 13th century, the violence in India was almost, in terms of war, only the Kalinga war, and in terms of other human violence, like Sati and Thagi, in which the deaths were in, he says, in the entire period, tens of thousands. This is all the history of India about violence. But if you look at the history of the rest of the world, he estimates that from 618 million people at the minimum, and some 1.2 billion people at the maximum have been butchered, killed, and finished. So, the history of India about violence is give, will give us the clue about what kind of strategic thinking we had to avoid violence. The most important thing is the current strategic thinking only uh, deals with how to deal with violence, how to face violence, how to meet wars, how to meet adversaries, how to respond to it. But we had a higher strategic approach of how to avoid violence and we have been avoiding violence. And the source of it is what is known as the Tarka Shastra. That you could speak about the adversary's view, criticize the adversary, but you must study the adversary. This was the Arthasha, uh, the Tarka Shastra concept, which inhered in our civilization. That is how we were able to avoid if people with the different ideas could meet and discuss and discuss without promoting violence, then the violence won't be in the streets. That is why our wars were actually internal wars. There was no external war India faced. The rules of internal wars were so benign. And uh, our armies were not adversaries. They had a fight and the fight was more like sports. In fact, uh, maybe some of you will be greatly benefiting by reading Professor Padmanabha Menon's uh, History of Kerala, in which the Kerala Zamori kings and uh, the Portuguese had wars and the Zamori kings wrote letters to the Portuguese that this is how we wage the war and we will beat the drum in the morning after the sunrise, then we say we are ready for war. And then if you beat the drum only, then we will start attacking you. But in the evening at the sunset, if you beat the drum, we will stop the war. And you know, uh, we don't unnecessarily uh, disturb the people. Our agricultural operations have to go on. Our education has to go on. People should be undisturbed. So we have a very large playground outside our city. Then we will have a war there. Then why should we allow all our armies to clash? You choose 10 or 100 of your best warriors. We will choose 100 of our best warriors to fight. I mean, the Portuguese were stunned. Is the man asking for war or sports? <laughs> In fact, Zamari kings used to have wars like that. And whatever we read in Mahabharata, that the two warring groups will be having some drinks in the evening and next morning fighting. The Samari kings, when they had battles, the two armies used to have the same facility, same infrastructure, the same pond in which they will walk the horses, and they will even exchange their uh, uh, plates of meals. And at the beat of the drum, they will separate and begin fighting. This was the war culture of India. So, strategic culture as, uh, if I uh, see, I think it is uh, um, uh, Khajri Kamal who said this, it is intensely related to the role of war, rules of war. And it has also to do with the scale of violence. And it has to do with the adversary. Padmanabha Menon writes, that the Zamari kings gave up their noble rules of war because the Portuguese did not keep it. Understand, it is the enemy who teaches you how to wage wars. All our noble rules of war 
which are uh, discussed in abundance in not i am talking about the ancient times but in the contemporary times noble noble rules of war was the reason why india could not build an empire that's where uh, uh, kautilya stepped in he wanted empire building so he felt that the concept of dharma vijaya or was a more a symbolic kind of rashtra he wanted a nation and state to be aligned otherwise we had a nation but we did not have one state and so he wanted the nation state alignment and for that he wanted empire building and he suggested that we should go for what is known as lobha vijaya the difference between dharma vijaya and lobha vijaya is that in dharma vijaya even if you have a war you don't have a war you actually have one yagya called uh, uh, this uh, ashwamedha yagya if other kings attend your yagya they have accepted your society if they do not you have a war with them if you win the war you do two things you have to go and worship in the temple in which the defeated king used to worship to assure the people of the kingdom that he will not disturb their culture or way of worship second thing is he has to restore the kingdom back to the defeated king or the person who is the descendant of the defeated king chanakya affair this is not going to help to build an empire and the third kind of victory was asura vijaya where you not only take over the treasury but you also take over the women folk everything of the defeated king it is the unanimous verdict of all the indologists and modern scholars the third kind of war was never practiced in india chanakya recommended the second type of victory lobha vijaya to build empire why chanakya became illegitimate in india after him it was because kadambari bana he said this gentleman is promoting adharma how can you grab another person's territory and build your empire this is adharma and with that chanakya ceased to have legitimacy and his book was consigned to library and one copy was found in 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 mysore you must understand how chanakya ceased to be relevant in the curriculum in the in the discourse because he said something which was not in tune with the philosophy and culture of india that's where culture and philosophy play a very important role in shaping uh, strategic thinking so india developed an adversarial strategic thinking only after the we faced the first enemy that is Uh, alexander in fact in pakistan government's website website i found this i think it is for the scholars to check and uh, uh, do further study that uh, i think it is habib khan who wrote in the history and culture of pakistan that it was in um, in takshashila that alexander uh, and kautilya met actually alexander ordered the arrest of kautilya so there are two different versions he never met and he met and it is there he understood that there is any there is an enemy who will exterminate you this kind of enmity was unheard of in india that an enemy will exterminate you and there he began devising this thinking this is what the author says and i do not know whether it is corroborated and substantiated by other pieces of evidence available so my feeling is that kautilya or the indian approach to strategic thinking can be studied in isolation with reference to only the books which are contemporary or offshoots or derivative of arthya shastra it has to be a multidisciplinary study as what was the prevailing thing in the world in india and my feeling is the sharpest turn in the uh, in strategic thinking came because of the abrahamic religions which had one god 
and so it had to win the world for that god and you did not have any god which asked you to win a war see you please understand that we lacked the philosophical and religious drive for strategic thinking or uh, as an autogenous or endogamous development so my feeling is that we have to integrate the indian view of vasudeva kutumbakam which is really an antidote to the contemporary strategic thinking which presupposes an adversary an adversarial thought when you say that them versus approach is wrong on that basis kadambari bana delegitimized uh, chanakya you must understand the philosophical contradictions in india between what we call a strategic thinking today and what we regard as a philosophy that has prevented violence so my feeling is my request to the scholars is without confining yourself to the uh, um, interpretations or the periodicity or dating of uh, tarka shastra a multidisciplinary study is needed as to how strategic thinking evolved in india and strategic thinking was not merely related to war it related to how to make a society functional peaceful live with uh, mutual respect tolerance these are all uh, issues which should go into making what is strategic thinking how this country was integrated mahatma gandhi says so much about in uh, in his hind uh, suraj i think some more a helicopter view is needed if i may request the scholars because you are scholars i am no scholar so all of you will have to put together a kind of a concept note which will give an overview because india is going to be a very important force in the coming years people are world is beginning to look at india particularly in the vacuum that has been caused by a dictatorial china and a world which is looking to integrate and work on the base of uh, uh, democracy versus the rest india will have a very critical role to play in shaping the world's opinion i think vif is a very important and critical nationalist institution to drive this process connected with so many strategic thinkers the intellectual assets that they have commands today is phenomenal and this this has to be weaponized and this has to be uh given lot of inputs and one of the critical inputs that we need is what is strategic thinking in india changed in definition after the adversaries came we had strategic thinkers who knew how to manage a society how to manage ambitions how to manage the conflicting uh, desires of people so this later transformed into how to manage competing in these adversaries i think this transition is also important to study thank you very much thank you uh, guru murthy ji for those words and i think uh, you made a very interesting point and important point about uh, looking at uh, all these texts not just the shastra but others from a totally different uh, point of view than simply going into this nitty gritties of uh, uh, debates about uh, uh, the you know using the western lens to understand whether these are good texts bad texts incomplete texts insufficient texts and so on we have our own task to fulfill and uh, the very fact that uh, uh, the i'll come to you the concept of uh, uh, strategy which is if limit we limit ourselves only to war and conflict then i think we are missing out a lot in our own uh, thinking so as you said uh, nation building society building behavior among with each other all this is a part of uh, a strategy so uh, we should uh, i think take a broader view of uh, strategy and then see whether we have a strategic thinking or not so thank you very much for that and uh, to those who are uh, listening uh, shri guru murthy ji last year had written a, a very interesting essay in our which is there in our annual uh, report which is on our uh, uh, website uh, you could read that and uh, he has written another uh, uh, a random thoughts kind of uh, essay which uh, will be publishing uh, shortly and which will also appear as part of our uh, annual report 
and i think some of the ideas that we talked about are also mentioned in that so uh, there would be some uh, interesting uh, points 